Live from Lincoln Center is made possible by a major grant from MetLife, the company that helps you make sense of it all. And on behalf of MetLife's affiliate, the New England, planning for your success. Live from Lincoln Center is also made possible by grants from the Robert Wood Johnson Jr. Charitable Trust, the Fan Fox and Leslie R. Samuels Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Good evening and welcome. It's an early spring evening on the plaza here at Lincoln Center, and we're about to launch into a warm, rich evening of Brahms here at Alice Tully Hall. Tonight's program is called a celebration of Brahms, but that's only half of it, because this evening also celebrates the singular joys of making music on a small scale. Chamber music is truly family size in that it was meant for the home, Fortunately for all of us who love it and don't have it at home, at least live anyway, its, its charms do translate to the stage. Now you know there are many chamber music fans all over the world, and they all have the special smile of those who are in on some secret. If you aren't already in the club, this performance just may be your in initiation. This evening, members of the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center have invited some friends who I think define the term special guest. Jesse Norman and Pinkus Zuckerman occupy that rarefied zone inhabited by a small handful of musicians who are revered by their colleagues but also admired by a worldwide public. In a moment, the concert's going to begin and we will hear for ourselves why they take time from conducting and recitals and operas and orchestral performances to play family-sized music. And at intermission, we'll come backstage to visit with tonight's artists. And I'll see you then.
It's really challenging, I think. You two have played, in addition to with great orchestras, a lot of chamber music. I have a brother who does chamber uh, things, with, he's a flute player. All of you talk about the rapport between players in a chamber situation. Is it more so than in an orchestra situation? And if so, why? Well, being in an orchestra, of course, you have the, the whole sound of the orchestra. You're, you're part of this big ensemble and you have the conductor who's basically giving you his ideas and you're trying to interpret that in your best fashion. In chamber music we have maybe more conductors on stage except that we all have to suppress our egos a little bit because we're not all soloists, we're soloists yet chamber players. So we have to combine these two forms together to come to a common ingredient, a common performance. It's almost wants. literally more in concert than, than a, with a large orchestra, then, isn't it? Exactly. True. Yeah. How do you, do you feel differently when you're playing in well, chamber group? I feel that it's r really all about listening. And yeah. I find in orchestra it's, it's even more challenging because you need to listen to the horn solo and the clarinets and you have to make sure that you're fitting together in a very large texture. Sure. With a smaller ensemble, um, you listen as well, but you feel like it's, a, it's more intimate because there's only five of you instead of a hundred yeah. on stage. And there's no conductor also, so you're not having to interpret sure, that would make what he wants for the large group. That's right. This particular piece is, is magnificent. And the fact that Brahms said that it was the last thing he was going to write, fortunately he didn't, he didn't keep his didn't promise. Didn't stop there. <laughs> and it, th there's nothing about it that sounds farewell, you know, like the, like the Tchaikovsky Sixth or the Mahler Ninth or Tenth. Okay. Uh, what do you suppose he had in mind when he decided to, well, he wanted to hang it up? he also... Uh, was going to write this, I think, originally for two pianos and then for another sort of string quintet with two cellos instead of two violas. And then he finally decided upon this version. And basically, he maybe he couldn't make up his mind, but it's so such a big piece. It's actually quite orchestral, it's talking about or so. yeah, orchestras. It is, it, it so he finally came up with this two violas, and we like to call viola quintets because they're two violas. And obviously, it works in a grand scale, and it works. In a, fabulous way. It sure does when I listen to you guys playing it. <laughs> it's magnificent. And uh, we're going to hear more Brahms very shortly. Right. And thank you for visiting with us now. Thank you.
Well, magnificent to hear. Ah, oh, she's fantastic. Yeah, 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 wow. Singer like that, and and in that that kind of a setting too, which is really chamber music and not just a solo with a. Company. What is chamber music? What is it? I guess it was written for small chambers, but that's <laughs> all I can think of. You know what chamber music is? What is your it's definition? The process of listening, which music is more? Yeah. Yeah, that's what chamber music is. If you don't play chamber music, you're not a musician. As far as I'm concerned, you've got yeah. to play chamber music. Yeah, and if you're a composer, you've got to write real music. You can't cover it up with a battery of uh, <laughs> percussion and brass right, and right. stuff. That's so, fascinating. What now? I have to ask you, what lured you to this particular program? What part did the program play in getting you here to participate? 
Well, it's a celebration of Brahms, and when David called me uh, a couple of years ago to, uh, to participate, I said, by all means, I'd love to play uh, as much music as I can uh, with certain people we talked about, and of course, these are the people I wanted to play with. And I don't, I, I don't have a problem with playing first, second, third, fourth, you know, I'm utility infielder, it's fine too. Um, I can't sing, I wish I could. And then we could do some Brahms duets or something with Jesse, but I, and I can't play the piano, thank God, you know. So, it's like Perlman sings. Well, he thought he sang. Well, he sang a <laughs> no, little bit, you know. He sings. One little note here and there. What kind of adjustment do you have to make as opposed to solo, you know, performing solo? I and, pay them a lot. I, I pay them a lot of money, <laughs> so do. they follow what I say. <laughs> what do you mean <laughs> adjustment? No, you We get together, we play, we discuss, and we change everything in the performance, yeah. you know. <laughs> we don't do a... There's no adjusting. You have to listen. You just have to listen. You and you like have the to theater. listen to each other. I well, it's like the well. theater, you yeah, know. Sure. Actors, uh, we can't do it alone. We have sure. to play with other people. Yeah. That's the essence of chamber music, music making in general. It, it would be a free-for-all with a large orchestra if there wasn't a conductor. But in chamber music, who makes the decisions that a conductor would make? Seriously, the music makes the decision. It, the, those it notes that we play today, yeah. they've been there for a hundred years, yeah. some more. Um, that's the decision we have to come to in a group of four, a group of five, group of 150, it doesn't matter. As conductor, what you're trying to do is given the opportunity to express the words uh -huh. through you. Yeah. In playing, you're doing it through the instrument immediately, but when you have a group of four or five, you have to do the same thing. Sure. It's essentially the same thing. Yeah. It's a team. It's yeah. not one or the other. Now, in this quintet coming up that we're going to hear uh, after intermission, what special thing should the listener look, be on the lookout for to appreciate it most? The interplay between voices. Uh, there's a lot going on inside, inside voices, viola, cello. The yeah. piano has an enormous, a million notes to play. Very hard piece for the piano, yeah. uh, which David does very easily because he's so <laughs> gifted in the, in the keyboard. I always so. marvel at the arrogance of composers who just say, that's their problem, I'll write it this tough. We look <laughs> right. forward to hearing it though, and nice talking Thank with you in person, Same and not here. just on the telephone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. What a beautiful sound. That was great to hear. Thank you. And I'm going to ask you what, what adjustment you make, if any, in performing a chamber piece like that, as opposed to doing a solo where you're accompanied by mm -hmm. a piano or a big orchestra. Well, the wonderful thing about uh, chamber music is that, of course, what everybody else has said is this wonderful interplay and the intimacy of our working together and interreaction of mm -hmm. the musicians. That's a wonderful thing. It's marvelous if one can achieve that uh, when performing with a larger group, but that is very rare. And with chamber music, it's very simple because we're close together. Everybody has a solo at some point. Everybody yeah. is accompanying everybody else. And we all sort of, sometimes we share the musical phrase. Sometimes one instrument might start a phrase and it's taken up by another one. And it's just, um, it's a wonderful, quiet, intimate way to make music. I love it. Yeah, I'm sure you've sung a lot of other chamber music. Is there anything special about Brahms that you like in these, these particular songs? Well, I like Brahms because it's very tuneful. Yeah. I really love it. I sing a lot of music, uh, 20th century music, contemporary music, where I don't have these lovely melodic lines all the time. But I do, I do love Brahms, and I love these songs. I love the, the fact that the viola is very close to the sound that the solo voice, the singer, is meant to make. The, the colors are very similar, yeah. and that I enjoy very much. Yeah, particularly since this is for alto and, and yes. viola and piano, yes. and you have tremendous range, so you well, can sing soprano you. and alto. Well, I do, I do, do what you, I can. Is there a preference, or that's an awful question to ask, but no. the, do, is there anything special about singing in the alto range that, you, that appeals to you? Well, I do it because it's comfortable for me and because I love the music. I mean, that's why I do anything that I do. I sing the music that, that suits my voice, whether it's meant to be soprano or lyric soprano or contralto or whatever. If I really feel that I have empathy for what it is I'm going to sing or what it is I want to sing, then I will do it. It doesn't matter the, the vocal registration that's supposed to be there. Well, your range appears to be not only vocally, but you have quite a range from singing solo and operatic arias and and chamber music of this kind. You yes. get in the right gear for each one. Yes, I do. Yeah. And I, I don't really have to make an adjustment vocally. I think that the adjustment is more a mental one 
because really? I know, I know, yes, when I'm singing with a small group like this, I mean, we can change things much more easily. There's much more flexibility than one would have with a large orchestra. And we can change things, and as Pinker said, do it completely differently than we did it in rehearsal. That's amazing. I would yes. think it would be more challenging and more nerve-wracking, but apparently you, you feel very much at home. Oh, with no, it's, it's somehow, it's somehow more, more comfortable because mm -hmm. we, are, we are there together, and everybody, as I said before, supporting you know, yeah. one the other is great. Wonderful. Well, it's certainly a great thing to be on the listening end of it. And well, I, you're very I, kind. I really appreciate the chance to chat with you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse Norman. I'll start with you, David, to ask what, what goes into making a decision about what constitutes the program. Now, we know it's going to be a Brahms chamber mm -hmm. concert. What made you decide which ones to play, to do? Well, you can't go very far wrong with Brahms because he was such a perfectionist. Um, he composed a great deal of music which was never heard. He was his own worst critic and best editor, so only his favorite music got published. So for those of us who perform and make programs, there's only great music of Brahms. There are no duds. And so for a concert like tonight, um, we have the opportunity of featuring the great artists that, who are the performers that we have on hand and choosing from an array of wonderful works. And of course, the centerpiece for tonight's concert were the viola songs with, with Jesse Norman and mm -hmm. Pinkus Zuckerman and David Golub, um, because Pinkus had told me that they had done them together before, and it was a great way of having a centerpiece for a program like this. And then the first work and the last work are two really big pieces that we're using to end a year-long celebration of the music of Brahms. And Brahms wrote some really big music, and we have some really big players. And by that, I mean not just big, loud sounds, great range of emotion. And I don't mean physically, <laughs> Ida Kabbalah. <Kabbalfin. laughs> <laughs> great range of emotion and colors and the ability to do, um, to realize what Brahms did with his chamber music, which was to take enormous concepts and ideas and compose them for really smaller groups. Yes, and you're right, he was a perfectionist that didn't like to have any unfinished early sketches or stuff get, get out, uh, out of his control. With so many composers, you can say, this is a good work or this is a strong work. With Brahms, they're all masterpieces. It seems that way, that's, that's true, yeah. How do, I, how, how do you feel about, the, about a selection like this and your participation in it, do some things seem more daunting than others in the makeup? It, the first piece was very daunting. You know, um, it's been a, such a, I just have to say, it's been such a rush playing with all these people. I mean, yeah. uh, of course, the music has been absolutely, you know, stellar. But to work with the artists that I've been working with this week and to perform these last few nights, it's just, it's, it's something that's a real high point yeah. of my year. And to sit there and have that sound of Pinka Zuckerman next to me, it's just, I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a yeah. privilege. It yeah, really is. Right. So I've had a great time, a really great time. We're going to hear a work of a younger Brahms. It was the last one on the, on the concert. How, do, how does that compare with that Opus 111 that we heard earlier? Uh, well, Gary. The, the piano quintet is a piece that that has an incredible amount of uh, almost unbridled passion to it. It's, it's, it's wild, it, it has incredible abandon to it. The, the work that, we've, that we heard at the beginning, that we played at the beginning, is a piece that, that's really the product of the very mature Brahms. It's much more compact, it's, it's much more um, well-structured in the sense that things move easily from one thing to the next. The piano quintet is a piece that's rugged, it's passionate, and it has a tremendous amount of momentum and force. I think that's, that's its, its great uh, appeal. A lot of weight's going to be on you, David, <laughs> <laughs> on, on that piece. What, what's your appraisal of it? Well, I, one thing I love about the piece, about the music, of the chamber music of Brahms in general, is its orchestral nature. And this piece is, the, this aspect is certainly typified by the quintet, yeah. but Brahms is really, for me, the first composer that really blurs the distinction between what's orchestral and what's chamber. The, the chamber music is obviously very orchestral in nature, and the orchestra music uh, in comp compensation is oftentimes very chamber-like. And when you play a piece like the Brahms Quintet, you really participate in the visceral thrill of, of a great deal of power, but also a, a lot of intimacy at the same time, and it's a great rush. Sure, look forward to it. We've got to let everybody go back to work now. <laughs> We're going to be enjoying it. And thank you all for the chance thank to chat you. with thank you. you.
Live from Lincoln Center was made possible by a major grant from MetLife, the company that helps you make sense of it all. And on behalf of MetLife's affiliate, the New England, planning for your success. Live from Lincoln Center was also made possible by grants from the Robert Wood Johnson Jr. Charitable Trust, the Fan Fox and Leslie R. Samuels Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts.